Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Wynne Williams, the Associate Chief of the Renal Division at Massachusetts General Hospital, the founding director of the Center for Diversity and Inclusion, and a deputy editor at the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm happy to moderate this last session of this truly groundbreaking conference. And our session is entitled, Recruitment and Retention to Support a Diverse work Workforce. I'm joined today by an esteemed panel. They are Dr. Jennifer Manley, Dr. Ann Becker, Dr. Cesar Castro, and Dr. Ravi Dadani. The focus of the session this afternoon is, as the title reflects, the importance and the challenges of recruitment and retention to develop a diverse research workforce. As several presenters um, in this conference have underscored over the past two days, this is an issue that has been at the forefront of medicine, academic medicine, for at least the past 30 years. I'm going to briefly present data that touches on progress or the lack thereof that we've made today. But before doing that, I'm going to present our panel uh, to you. I'm going to begin with Dr. Uh, Jennifer Manley. She is a professor of neuropsychology in the Department of Neurology at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Her research focuses on mechanisms of disparities in cognitive aging and Alzheimer's disease specifically investigations of social forces across the life force, such as educational opportunities, racism and discrimination, socioeconomic status, and how these factors relate to cognition and brain health later in life. Dr. Manley's research has been funded by the NIH and the Alzheimer's Association. She has authored over 220 peer-reviewed publications and 10 book chapters. She was the 2014 recipient of the Tony Wong Diversity Award for Outstanding Mentorship, and was the recipient of the Paul Satz International Neuropsychological so Society Career Mentoring Award in 2020. Dr. Manley was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2021. She served on the HHS Advisory Council on Ad Alzheimer's Research, Care, and Services from 2011 to 2015, and is a member of the National Advisory Council on Aging. Dr. Ann Becker is Dean for Clinical and Academic Affairs at Harvard Medical School. She is the Maud and Lillian Presley Professor of Global Me Health and Social Medicine and Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. After receiving an MD PhD at Harvard, she completed residency training in psychiatry at Mass General, as well as a master's degree in epidemiology, the Harvard School of Public Health. An anthropologist and psychiatrist Dr. Beth Becker's areas of research focus include the social and cultural mediation of eating disorder pathology, social barriers to health or mental disorders, and school-based uh, mental health promotion. Dr. Becker has previously served as vice chair of the HMS Department of Global Health and Social Medicine and director of the HMS MD-PhD Social Sciences Program, and was the founding uh, director of the Massachusetts General Hospital Eating Disorders Clinical and research program. As the Harvard Medical School Dean for Clinical and Academic Affairs, she leads the HMS Office for Clinical and Academic Affairs and coordinates close, closely with three other HMS, HMS offices, academic and research integrity, diversity, inclusion, and community partnership, and the Office for Faculty Affairs. Dr. Cesar Castro is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the Harvard Medical School, as well as Director of the Gynecologic Oncology Program in the, in the MGH Cancer Center. He is director of the cancer program in the MGH Center for Systems Biology. He is also a newly appointed faculty co-director for research in our MGH Center for Diversity and, Con and Inclusion. He is a translational oncologist with deep experience le leveraging nanotechnology and molecular imaging for solid tumor detection and serial profiling he serves on the steering committee for the NCI Liquid Biopsy Consortium and is chair of the MGB Phase I Cancer Clinical Trials IRB. Dr. Castro graduated from UC Berkeley and received his medical degree from UCSF, where he completed his internal medicine residency training. He completed an adult oncology fellowship from the Dana-Farber Mass General Brigham Cancer Care Program. And during this period, he also received a master's of medical sciences from Harvard Medical School, Dr. Castro has received independent funding from the NIH, Department of Defense, Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation, 
and ovarian cancer research fund, fund among others. And last but not least, Dr. Ravi Padani is the Chief Academic Officer for Mass General Brigham and Dean of the Faculty at MGB for Harvard Medical School. Dr. Thadani manages an approximate $2 billion research enterprise. He oversees several key system-wide departments at MGB, including Human Subjects Affairs, the Clinical Trials Office, Research Management, and the MGB Biobank. Also, graduate medical education across MGB. Dr. Dhanani managed a research laboratory at MGH for 25 years with a focus on kidney disease and developing diagnostics and therapeutics for women in compl with complications in pregnancy. And he's the former chief of the renal division um, at Mass General. He has published over uh, 300 manuscripts and has been inducted into several honor societies. He is a standing member of the FDA's cardiorenal division advisory panel. Dr. Dadani has received several distinguished awards, including the Harold Amos Faculty Diversity Award from Harvard Medical School, the Alumni Award of, of Merit from the Harvard T.H. Chan, Chan School of Public Health, and the John P. Peters Award from the American Society of Nephrology. He received his undergrad degree from Notre Dame, uh, a medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania, a master's in public health from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. So I want to uh, have you join uh, me in welcoming our esteemed uh, panel that are going to share their thoughts uh, and expertise on this important issue that uh, we're going to discuss in the next 40 to 45 minutes. So I'm going to uh, ask for the slide deck to, to be loaded there. And let's go to the next slide. So I want to start here just to, to touch on why this conference has been so important for us to present. And my, um, my uh, congratulations to the organizers of all the thought that's gone into plan planning for this two-day uh, symposium. So the impetus for this uh, conference and indeed this session is a renewed effort in the aftermath of the racial reckoning that's occurred over the past two years and the broad public outcry at after the murder of uh, George Floyd to address systemic racism in society and as it affects and uh, afflicts the medicine and so-called racialized medicine that may result in clinical constructs that do harm to communities of color. Next slide. So we've lost the slide on the screen. If we can get that back on the screen. There you go. So if you look uh, at one of the reasons that this is such an important uh, topic, one has to do with um, uh, areas that really have been co covered extensively in the past two days, and that is barriers to minority participation in clinical trials. First and foremost in this list is fear and mistrust that many minority populations have of organized medicine. Uh, a duly uh, one, if you will, uh, fear as a result of a number of misadventures the, the uh, prototype being the Tuskegee experiment, which has also been alluded to in the past couple of years, where 400 sharecroppers uh, from Macon County, Alabama, or um, uh, the natural history of syphilis was observed in this group, unbeknownst to this cohort, uh, at the hands of the CDC and the United States Public Health Service. And this has led to a deeply held dis mistrust, I would say, in organized medicine in the United States since that time uh, of that 40-year experiment that started uh, in the 1930s and 40s and, and ended in the early um, uh, 70s. But the last part uh, uh, variable on this list, the shortage of ethnic minority trial coordinators and principal investigators, trialists, is also an important uh, area of focus. Next slide. So last year in the New England Journal of Medicine, we published this report from Morris et al. looking at four decades of minority uh, student uh, matriculation 
uh, to academic medical centers in the United States. These investigators examined the four decades from 1978 to 2019 and reported on what we call the gap in representation. And they found that instead of this gap closing, it's actually widening for some groups that are underrepresented in medicine. Uh, next slide. I don't, it's gonna be hard to see this, but I'm gonna uh, narrow it, narrow it uh, for you. And the bottom left panel, what you see there is a modest increase in the enrollment of black women uh, across this four decade period from about 3.6 to 4.4% of all enrollees. Uh, and there was a greater increase, although modest, in the enrollment of Hispanic women from about 0.7% to 3.2%. However, in the bottom right panel in panel D, the percentage of black men actually decreased over this four decade long period from 3.1 to 2.9%. Uh, and there was a minimal change in the percentage of uh, Hispanic men uh, represented. And the point of this study was that the percentages of enrolled uh, students from groups that are underrepresented in medicine are far lower than the population distribution of these groups in the U United States uh, population by census. And by extension, the same would hold true for medical faculty across the United States. Next slide. And you see that in this slide and in the left panel here, you look at the census distribution for those who are underrepresented in, in medicine. You can see in that um, orange panel, it's about 33.4%. Uh, if you look at all the um, underrepresented groups that are, 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 um, are a part of the pie chart here. And if you look at the representation then in the right panel, uh, the distribution by ethnic minority of US medical school faculty, you can see that that number of those underrepresented men medicine in that rectangular orange square falls to about 9.5%. If you took African-American and Hispanic representation alone, it would be on the order of about a 9%, uh, fully a third of the population distribution in the country. Uh, next slide. So with those data as a framework to think about sort of who feel, uh, fills the pool that from which um, minority investigators, principal investigators, trialists might be um, uh, drawn, uh, we're gonna open up our conversation and discussion with the panel uh, at large. And so what I'm gonna do is ask each panel panelist to give an initial 30,000 foot view of where uh, they think we are in relation to the goals of developing a robust, diversified research uh, workforce the barriers and challenges and the comment on where they think we may be, where there may be important initiatives to move forward. We're just gonna open it up uh, to begin. I'm gonna ask Dr. Uh, Castro to kick it off. Thank you very much, Dr. Williams. Um, may I have the uh, slides, please? Perfect, so I wanted to capture in two slides just really why we need to invest in our UOM uh, investigators. And so this is uh, the recent data from 2021. These are all PIs uh, at MGH with NARO-1. And you see that uh, underrepresented investigators account for uh, 5%. And even within that 5%, only 1% are African-American. As we get more granular though, as next slide, please. You see that the average R01 funding for uh, UIM uh, PIs is actually larger, 792,000 compared to all comers of 595,000. So indeed, it pays to invest in a diverse workforce. So I want to take this moment to, to kind of to, to discuss how the air gets rather rarefied, if you, if you will, in the upper echelons of academia, and this includes associate professor and, and full professor. And so there are strategic imperatives, I think, that dictate that we need to focus on enhancing the depth and the breadth of the pipeline. And so impactful intervention should A, include effective mentor training, and B, the early development and the cultivation of research collaborator networks. This is even more pressing in this era of quote unquote team science, where the siloed investigator of yesteryear is increasingly replaced by dynamic multiple PI teams with complementary skill sets. Indeed, you know, we're seeing a lot of the innovation through such a multidisciplinary bent. So the UIM investigator of today must not only navigate these structural barriers that challenge sustained independent funding, 
Now they have to cultivate scientific relationships with other investigators, both within and outside their institutions. Given the reality that the number of UIM investigators in academia tends to be relatively low to begin with, that network of collaborators were likely not comprised just solely of UIM investigators. And so these investigators need to create additional value uh, through their own research trajectories through synergies with other investigators and create these collaborative networks. So the MGH uh, Center for Diversity and Inclusion, the CDI, has a storied 30-year history to date. On the research workforce side, solutions have targeted undergraduates and medical students interested in injecting research into their experiences, as well as senior fellows and junior faculty seeking to establish scientific roots at MGH. So the uh, next slide, please. So we have the, here are our, um, our summer research training program, the SRTP, our flagship uh, program seeks to identify and recruit high achieving UIM students, both within and outside of the Harvard system for an eight week immersive research experience at an MGH laboratory. So for many of those selected, their time at SRTP is also their first time in Boston. For a smaller few, it's the first time on a plane. Through hospital and philanthropic support, we're actually capable now of selecting 30 students and offer them a mentored research experience with high achieving scientists. And SRTP alumni have been quite successful in their career tracks and many return to MGH at some point later on for further their training or even be faculty. And so this summer, we've inaugurated an SRTP 2.0 version where SRTP alumni can return to MGH and partake in additional experiences with strong research components. This is meant to enhance their relationship with MGH. And I uh, draw your attention to the bottom, the Physician Scientist Development Award. And um, we can get to the next slide. Perfect. And so this award seeks to provide up to four years of career development support to MGH junior faculty with an optional component of loan repayment. So initially one award was offered and now multiple awards are offered to UIM physician scientists each year. And the track record has been outstanding. And so CDI has provided over $3 million to over 30 awardees over the years. And the return on our investment has led to a remarkable 45 million plus in grant funding. And that's just direct costs alone. So that's a 14X ROI. Currently, we're uh, putting the finishing touches on a two-year award for UIM PhD postdoctoral fellows that we seek to inaugurate in the year, next year or so. The award will provide salary support as well as an optional loan repayment component. And I believe that such an award could serve as an important recruitment tool since hospital-based postdoctoral fellowships without any hard money support, quote unquote, tend to be a deterrent. And importantly, it could also serve as an effective retention tool. A stipulation of this award includes interfacing with the activities of CDI so that includes presenting at our flagship UIM seminar series, the Chester PS Research Society. That includes reviewing SRTP abstracts, judging end of summer presentations and networking with other PSDA awardees. So we seek to intentionally establish and perpetuate this research ecosystem for each PSDA awardee in the spirit of fostering their research networks here at MGH. And this is important because Indeed, that the data does suggest that even at Harvard Medical School, junior faculty, individuals that don't have a strong research network, tend to feel isolated, tend to even leave for other institutions. So we really need to kind of further entrench their presence here. And then finally, on a per personal note, I came to MGH, as Dr. Williams alluded to, from UCSF for my clinical oncology fellowship. So I stayed as an instructor, rose the ranks to associate professor, and I wear various leadership hats, and I have a healthy network reach. I'm R01, U01 funded investigator. Just as important, I'm also a past SRTP and a PSDA recipient. So I can confidently say that CDI and their efforts have provided these key inflection points in my career. So through my current hat now as a faculty co-director for research at CDI, along with Professor Julie Price, I seek to create similar narratives for, for other promising UIM investigators particularly in the student kind of trainee and junior faculty uh, phases. Thank you.
a great Caesar. Thanks so much for that uh, uh, tour through our MGH uh, programmatic initiatives and your own personal story. I'm going to um, ask uh, Dr. Manley to give us uh, what she, if we take the slides down now, uh, the lay of the land at Columbia uh, and some of her observations about her own journey and what are the obstacles and challenges for, um, again, uh, those who want to strike out of careers in academic medicine who are underrepresented. Uh, Dr. Manley? Sure. Well, you know, I think that Columbia is um, maybe not surprisingly on a very similar journey to your institution. So I, I heard a lot of um, things in the last presentation that, that really uh, sound familiar. Um, you know, and working on um, uh, recruitment, retention, and advancement um, among um, investigators who have historically been excluded from those leadership um, uh, and and faculty positions is is a work in progress. Um, one of the things that I think um, we are working on um, that I was so pleased to see, um, you know, is is something like a loan repayment program. Um, you know, um, interim funding that that the funding that that these excellent investigators are receiving could, um, you know, potentially be used for that. Um, the NIH loan repayment program is um, a wonderful, uh, you know, uh, uh, resource, but sometimes it takes a couple of tries to get it going. And so for these, um, you know, early career um, uh, people or these recruits, um, what a wonderful resource for the, um, for the institution to give maybe some um, support in developing their loan repayment uh, program uh, uh, application, but also some interim support as well. Um, I think it would be tough, uh, painful for an incoming um, faculty to have to choose between loan repayment or research funding. So, um, you know, I think the key uh, uh, um, word that Dr. Williams said in the beginning is invest, um, investment. Um, at at Columbia, one of the recommendations that our anti-racist task force gave to the dean's office was um, that the success of a department or division should be tied to a, its success in recruitment of, uh, of faculty that are traditionally um, underrepresented in that, in that um, department. And so, um, what that means is that the dean, you know, in reviewing each chair, would tie this in, and so the chair success would be, um, you know, uh, closely linked, and the, they would be accountable um, for this recruitment. Because um, I think that uh, many of these programs are incentives, but ultimately it is um, a top-down leadership type of. Um, uh, you, you know, decision that needs a number of decisions that need to happen um, in order for this to 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 um, come through. Uh, the other piece that I would say is that um, you know a number of of different um, departments and divisions have done a really deep dive in talking with each other and doing a self examination of culture and climate. And I think that um, you know part of um, you know the programs that you just introduced are let's get let's give people more opportunity to work with us and if they work with us they'll love us and um, uh, that that's probably true in most cases in other cases um, I think it, you know the 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 culture and climate um, issues become very clear um, one of them is that. Uh, and I think all institutions sort of have this 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 issue, which is that um, our promotion and tenure um, uh, um, criteria are really um, based in um, in in whiteness as a credential, um, and so a lot of uh, uh, minority faculty, um, you know, are familiar with this. Thing called uh, minority tax, which is doing a lot of work, a lot of mentoring, a lot of service. Um, we have it both institutionally, we also have it externally. And so um, the, uh, I think that the, um, 
issue there is that that's not taken into account um, when it comes to promotion. Uh, so I think, um, you know, one of our key goals at Columbia is to serve this fourth purpose, which is to be of service to our community and be of service to our world. Medical institutions um, were not were not um, unfamiliar with that goal at all, and yet it's not um, a core uh, criteria for promotion. Uh, and so I think that needs to get aligned. And once that um, once that alignment has taken place and people are accountable for it within each um, within the leadership structure, um, you know that that really I think helps to make shifts in the climate and make it a place where people want to stay. Um, I'll stop there. Great. <clears throat> so um, I appreciate um, those incisive incisive comments, and I want to dovetail on them with uh, Dr. Becker. So, so um, Anne, if you will. Um, Dr. Manley talked about promotion and tenure and some of those challenges, and the era becomes increasingly rarefied for under, those who are underrepresented um, investigators at the upper echelons in promotion, and that certainly, I think, uh, is borne out by uh, HMS. So what are some of the recruitment and retention tactics that we can draw on? And, and if, you, if you like, we can pull up your slide set again, but would you uh, begin to comment? Yeah, thank you so much. And and if I could have um, my two slides uh, brought up, please. Thank you so much. And um, first of all, I I want to say good afternoon to everyone. And I will respond to um, these questions, but I also want to acknowledge the leadership and energy um, uh, which has been poured into this these topics by my colleagues, uh, Dean Joan Reed, who's the Dean for Diversity, Inclusion and Community Partnership, and also Dean Grace Wong, who's Dean for Faculty Affairs at HMS. And it, they're really the principal architects of some of the uh, work I'll describe here. Um, but first, I'm gonna show you uh, your initial question when was, where are we, where do we think we are? And you know, the answer is, if you look at this slide, is certainly not where we wanna be. And uh, let me walk you through this particular slide. So it tells a number of stories. First of all, you'll see here that uh, this is this shows the number of underrepresented medicine and also the number of or the percentage of Asian and Pacific Islander faculty from 2005 through 2021 in terms of percentage of the overall faculty. These are Mass General Brigham numbers, but the numbers for Harvard Medical School with all of the affiliates combined are, the percentages look very, very similar. So, but these are MGB here. And I should tell you the denominator, which is nearly 7,500. Um, so what you see is we've made very little headway. And, um, and even though that's an enormous faculty denominator and the numbers have gone up substantially over the past 15 years. Uh, we still aren't really seeing the progress we want to see in the percent. Uh, so, so this is, you know, take home number one. Um, the slide, the figure on the bottom uh, addresses the question about sort of the rarefication at the upper echelons. And this is also the story that um, we wish the slide did not tell, but it's the story, you know, in our data. So we have to reckon with it. Uh, as you see here that the percentages um, of underrepresented in medicine faculty over the past 15 years who are in higher uh, ladder faculty ranks has inched up, but it's relatively flat. So we really are not seeing the movement we'd like to see. And, um, and you know, you could ask yourself, is this because people are getting promoted and, and leaving? And, you know, let me tell you that we're if that's the reason we have faculty attrition and not that many underrepresented faculty at the higher ranks, that's cause for celebration of our faculty, if our faculty are that successful. However, we, you know, unfortunately, there are a number of factors and we don't really think that's the driving factor. If I could have the next slide, please. So let me say just a little bit about um, how we're thinking about this, uh, because obviously this is, uh, this is a balance of faculty recruitment and faculty retention. And I, I want to just say to start that there's a tremendous amount of hard work ahead, um, but it, the, it starts with a commitment. Um, by the leadership, which is very strong. Um, the, the dean of the medical school, the 
school and also the leadership at MGB and all of the hospital affiliates have a, a you know, a, a commitment, not just as a principal, but to demonstrating actions that support it. So, and I will just say a word about our guiding framework at Harvard Medical School. Um, this effort was led by Dean Reed, and the, the idea is that there are areas of focus that we need to work on, and these are all in parallel. So um, I would, so this is people and infrastructure, building community and belonging, addressing culture and communication, and holding accountable leaders and generating knowledge. And um, I would like to talk about um, really the first and the last of those, and basically um, about faculty search. This is where we have the most leverage at Harvard Medical School, faculty search. So we can do better here. And, uh, and the reason I say that is that across Harvard Medical School's affiliation and you know, all the hospital affiliates and the community, we have about 200 early career faculty searches per year. That is an opportunity to do much better. In fact, we could, you know, move things in a transformative way if we put our mind to it. And how does that happen? Well, we, we have been working very hard to engage decision makers in uh, best practices, of course, and we had a very robust engagement last year. The university uh, saw that the uptake at Harvard Medical School was so strong among faculty for an interest in engaging with growing their awareness around implicit bias. So we had a special session for decision makers because we know it's the decision makers who, who need to be um, uh, made aware and engaged in this process. And we, uh, we have also in the past year rolled out, and this will, the rollout will be completed in June, uh, we have rolled out a faculty search portal so we can be systematic and intentional about measuring diversity in our early career faculty searches. And so this search portal, which is going to be required for all of the early career faculty searches across all those 200 searches, allows functionality so that we can look at not just the composition of the search committee, which is of course important, but also the composition of the long list, the intermediate list, the short list, and the final candidates. And these data, of course, will become the metrics and we hope eventually the descriptive norms to which everyone aspires. And the portal has functionality so that during the search, the person chairing it can generate a report to sort of track his or her own progress. So let me move on to, with just a few words, about faculty retention. And, and I, I, this is um, something we think about a lot. Obviously, it starts with experience, improving the culture. Uh, and But we do a lot of asking and listening and reflecting. And by that, I mean that um, there was a recent PulseWave 2 survey across the faculty to really um, get a granular view on, do faculty feel valued? Do they feel they're receiving meaningful recognition? And those data are, you know, not always easy for us to see, but incredibly informative. And, and they do reveal that we have more work to do, especially in the underrepresented communities. Um, and, and then uh, we, we've already heard about the importance of mentoring and early career uh, research awards. So let me, let me pivot to talking about something that you brought up, Dr. Manley, around recognizing the uh, contributions that uh, underserved uh, communities and underrepresented faculty are making in the space of um, DEI. And what by that, I mean that we have, you talked about it as a minority tax. We also think of that here as an academic opportunity cost. And we are hearing um, that uh, certainly, um, this is displacing time for underrepresented 
faculty to engage in the scholarly work that they might prefer to do. So we have made a start to at least recognize this in the promotion process in two different ways. The first way is to frame a significant supporting activity uh, around diversity, equity, and inclusion so that all of the activities, all of the community service, the mentorship, et cetera, can be recognized and counted in the promotion process. The other has to do with, um, with a new professorial title that we are almost ready to roll out, cautiously optimistic about this, is going to a Harvard Corporation vote very soon. And this title specifically recognizes individuals who have an impact on the practice of medicine. There are several categories, but one of the categories is those who advance the quality of health and health delivery in minoritized and underserved communities. And um, so for example, that could include leadership, launch of novel service learning programs. It could include uh, programs that integrate service learning, clinical expertise, and advocacy. And it, it would um, it include uh, it, you know, it, our faculty who establish community-based or other novel <laughs> programs aimed at serving the health needs of these communities. And uh, this is our, you know, this is our response to recognizing that oftentimes this work is very, very challenging and may not yield the kind of promotion capital that unfortunately um, our system is, you know, set up to, to recognize. And it, so we just, you know, we, we are hoping that we, this will uh, rectify some of that situation. However, uh, we know, unfortunately, that there's, there's a long way to go. And then finally, uh, we are, we, we want to be sure we are very mindful that faculty don't feel recognized as, as they should feel. Uh, they, I mean, as much as we feel they, they are recognized. And in order to improve on that, we are revamping, uh, we are revisiting processes we have for nominating faculty to certain honors. So for example, uh, for nominating faculty to, um, to endowed chairs, which is the highest academic honor you can have at Harvard, we've structured the process now so that every time there's a nomination, the department chair who uh, frames the nomination is asked to say, who else was eligible for this award? And how did you consider gender and underrepresented in medicine uh, equity when you were choosing your nominees? And uh, that is that has been very well received. I will let you know about outcomes in a couple of years if it worked. And we're turning now to other processes to see if we can integrate um, that kind of approach into those processes as well. Um, I will stop. You can take my slide down and I'll stop there. <clears throat> uh, thank you so much, Anne. Um, so Ravi, you know, as we um, begin to look at wrapping up our, our session here, you know, it occurs to me that I'd like you to speak to, to two other um, uh, areas. And one, uh, with your, your head as it is, as it, as it is now, um, as the chief academic officer for MGB, but also as formerly mm -hmm a chief of service. In your former position, we had outstanding candidates that we recruited and we developed their careers. They've gone on to do amazing work nationally. I can think, and I know you can too, of at least a handful of individuals, but we didn't retain them. And one question is why can't we manage to hold on? We celebrate their success at other institutions. We lose them to Columbia. We lose them to Hopkins, but but why can't we here retain them when there is such a need? And second, the second question, Ravi, is um, in our billion-dollar enterprise for research, uh, we we um, tout this a lot that uh, MGB is one of the 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 uh, most well endowed, if you if you will, in terms of reach funding, freestanding institutions hospital-based academic medical centers in the country. Um, with a billion dollar portfolio, why can't we um, leverage some of those resources to actually tackle a lot of the incentive, incentives we need to recruit and retain talent? So thanks, uh, Wynn, and appreciate those uh, comments and questions, I would say. I'm gonna touch on 
a few of the comments that my colleagues, my esteemed colleagues, have actually made in, uh, to address the question uh, that you pose or questions that you posed. Um, we heard from Dr. Manley not just about recruitment and retention, but about advancement. And I sometimes think that we don't uh, pay enough attention to that. One of the challenges you had and I had when, when we were both leading the division of nephrology at Mass General uh, for about four or five years is we did a terrific job, just as you said, bringing individuals from underrepresented um, uh, backgrounds into the division, gave them positions, gave them an opportunity. Where did we fail? We did not, at least over time, provide them with a pathway where they could see their future as leaders in various areas. What was their path to becoming a division chief, a chief of medicine, or a director? What was their path to actually becoming uh, an esteemed uh, investigator and publishing in high-level journals? What was their path for becoming uh, and developing their own laboratory uh, and building a laboratory of 20 people? What was their path? We spent a lot of time on recruitment and retention. And at that point, while we felt we were successful, and I probably blame myself more than you here, um, we did not pay as much attention in terms of providing that path. And so when things became busy, when we became occupied, and those individuals who had been successful asked the question, what's next? When they didn't see that path ahead, they went on and actually did amazing things and got amazing grants and amazing jobs in other locations. And in fact, we're proud of those accomplishments. And you and I talked about one just recently that appeared in the New York Times and said, how could, how could that happen? And the individual saw a path elsewhere that we could not provide. And I would say that's probably number one. And Dr. Manley touched on that. The second point um, uh, Cesar touched on actually, which was this network and, and collaborative network, unbelievably important. When I know 20 plus years ago, when you started that program, the CDI program, I suspect you didn't think about the network that you were creating at that time. And here you see uh, Cesar, uh, Cesar as, a, as a product of that network. But that network was not something that was established and essentially evaporated. That network actually grew and continued to grow. And what Cesar reminded us of is you're having post, you know, graduates from that program come back now and actually spend more time in this organization, right? to be part of the family. And I could not emphasize that more in terms of, again, going back to the retention, recruitment, advancement, and believing that you're actually part of a group of individuals like yourselves who can actually make successes and advances in an, in an environment like ours. And so his comments on, on the network and the collaborative network, I would say, uh, resonated. In fact, when if you remember when we were um, uh, heading the Division of Nephrology, we brought five individuals from underrepresented backgrounds in at the same time. And it was their network, but it was a network that we created, you created, in fact, and helped us create in the division. You then heard from, from Dr. Becker about the importance of search committees and promotion. And what were the other areas that we were somewhat successful in, but not as successful in, I would say. And that is, in years gone by, as we all know, uh, appointments for becoming a director, becoming a vice chair, becoming a leader were often anointed. It was almost almost like a, like a papal a, 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 a anointment where we wanted you to become the director of XYZ. We've changed that thanks to people here on this call and others. And that is we are mandating now search committees for all major appointments, even if it means just a vice chair, not even a division chief but a vice chair of a position, a head of research, a director of the ICU, those kinds of opportunities are meaningful, even though they may seem small and, and not so meaningful, but, but mandating, as Anne nicely outlined, that we have search committees so that there's a fair share and an equal opportunity for all individuals and not just somebody's friend and not just somebody's uh, pal, if you will, uh, to be put into those positions. So each of my esteemed colleagues have touched on areas that we were successful in, I would say, win, and also areas that we probably could have uh, done better in. I'm gonna end with one last comment and hand it back to you. And that goes to, um, I believe, what, what's in the chat, or at least the questions, uh, maybe touching on some of the questions, and I, I believe we touched on one or two of them. And what I realized from working with you, Win, and I really thank you for this, is that it's not one size fits all. When we felt we had to 
um, uh, do a better job of recruiting individuals from diverse backgrounds where we had failed miserably, you reminded me that the needs are different for different people and we need to be flexible mm -hmm. enough. Many divisions, departments and chairs feel like there's a structure and people have to fit into that structure. And I think what you opened my eyes to help me understand is that, you know, sometimes the needs are very different and we need to be able to provide those needs. Um, you remember when we provided loan repayment for one of the individuals, another one um, asked for childcare support, another individual asked for a car uh, loan that, that had to be paid off. And I remember one who actually is still with us, but I won't mention her name. Um, uh, fortunately, she's still with us. Um, <laughs> she wanted to just go back and see her mother in Philadelphia uh, once a month. Otherwise, she was going to move to Philadelphia. And thanks to you, right, we were able to provide that. So it is not one size fits all. It's being able to be flexible. Um, uh, and frankly, that's just uh, uh, an issue of leadership and mentorship as well. And I just want to thank you for that, Wayne. So those are the, the few comments I would add to the comments that my colleagues have shared. Well, thank you so much, Robbie, and thank you for those reminiscences. I uh, appreciate that very much. Um, I'm going to wrap it up here because we have uh, only a five minutes before Dr. Dadani has to wrap the entire conference up. I want to spend one more minute with uh, each of you, if I could, with really brief comments, beginning with Dr. Manley, because uh, of your um, awards for outstanding mentorship. Just for each of you, really quickly, and you know. 15, 20 seconds or so, the value of mentorship and how it fits in. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that I could say uh, much more than um, Dr. Tadani just said about your mentorship when you were uh, recruiting people. It sounds like you listened to people. And, um, you know, I think that's one of the, the key skills. Um, I do think that, um, you know, one of the things we're, um, you know, pushing for um, at Columbia, we'll see if we get there, is, is uh, support for a mentoring academy and a, and a network. Um, it, it sounds like you've got something like that in your, in your center where, um, you know, we could scholarship to faculty who show a commitment to diverse mentorship. It really does take um, a lot of time. Um, expert coaching resources for uh, for faculty. Um, there's a lot of challenges for early career faculty in mentorship. Um, uh, each faculty, you know, the mentorship plan for new faculty at the time of hire is sometimes sort of thrown in there, kind of haphazard, not really thoughtful, um, you know, that that would be reviewed by the dean's office for, uh, you know, one of the, 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 the faculty deans. And then um, a process um, in uh, each uh, department that's that sort of um, you know standard for reviewing uh, that mentorship plan and you know making sure we're listening to each early career person at that time about their mentorship team um, that that has some sort of central support. So I'll I'll well, stop there. It's more infrastructure talk. <laughs> okay. Well, listen, I'm going to wrap it up. Otherwise, Robbie won't get his just due here. But I want to thank uh, this outstanding uh, discussion for the past hour. Thank uh, you, my, again, esteemed co colleagues who are part of the panel. Thank you for your comments and, um, and what you provided. A lot, food, a, lot, a lot of food for thought in terms of how we move ahead and achieve these goals. Thank you for a very informative and rich session. So, Ravi, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Anne, and really thank you to the panelists as well. Really fantastic um, group and an important topic, obviously, of recruitment and, and, and retention.